Hey, I'm Joe Connolly here with the founders of Voodoo 3D Printing in Brooklyn. Now, 3D printing is a lot like cryptocurrencies. We've all heard of them. We know a little bit about them, we think. And the same goes for 3D printing. John, what can you explain to us is 3D printing? Absolutely. So 3D printing is a way of making objects similar to all the other ways that we've ever made you know, parts and products before. Now, there are a few different types of manufacturing methods. Uh, one is called subtractive manufacturing. So that is where you are cutting material off of a block of material, like sculpting, to make your final part or your object. Uh, there's also a method of manufacturing called transformative manufacturing, where you take a material and you heat it up and you mold it into something else. So that is injection molding, for instance. Sculpting, molding. Exactly. What else? And so then there's the third type of manufacturing, which is additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, where you add material together to actually create your finished part. And that's, that's the essence of 3D printing. So instead of ink in a printer, you put substances. Exactly. And so to so imagine kind of your, your basic 3D printer, uh, everyone knows kind of what a hot glue gun looks like, right? Hi. So imagine a hot glue gun where you draw a picture on paper and you move your glue gun up a little bit and you draw another picture on top of your first one. And if you do that again and again and again, after you do it maybe a hundred or a couple hundred times, you get your final object. So in a way, it's like a printer that is a paintbrush. Exactly. And you just keep painting and painting and painting. Continuously adding material to your object until you have your finished part. What is 3D, uh, Voodoo 3D printing making now? What's your main business now? We have two kind of main businesses today. Uh, we serve engineers uh, who are making prototypes but also scaling up their production runs. So this may be somebody who works in a, a factory or manufacturing facility making parts that they're using on site, uh, or it may be an engineer designing a consumer product getting their first samples, and then getting their first thousand units out into the world. We make the plastic parts that go into those products. And you make it and then ship it to them from Brooklyn, or do you rent them a 3D printer for them to make it themselves at their office? So we have a factory of 200 3D printers right here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Walls of printers, Walls right? Walls of printers. Uh, printers as far as the eye can see. Um, except we've fit them all in a 2,000 square foot facility, stacked two and three high, uh, and that density is what allows us to operate profitably in uh, in New York City. Now, as we sit here taping this today, how many employees do you have at the office or shop in Brooklyn, running these printers or feeding the printers? Yeah, so we currently have 22 full time employees, wow. and that includes the four of us. I would say the really interesting thing about our company compared to a lot of other small businesses and startups is the diversity of, of roles and of people at Voodoo. We have everyone from uh, a factory team, we have a six or seven person factory team who are in charge of actual production, all the way to software engineers who have a very different background. Oliver, a year or two from now, what will the impact a year or two down the road of, of 3D printing be on companies and consumers? Uh, well, we're really excited uh, about shortening the time it takes to get a product from idea to market. Um, so one of the huge advantages of 3D printing is all you need to start is a design file. Compared to injection molding, the process takes, you know, uh, you know it's, it's about 10 times faster. I, I don't totally. Weeks and months, Weeks to, and months to get a product or a part off the ground with injection molding where we can have thousands of parts out the door in days. Uh, and, and tweaking that product if it's not quite right with the first version is much easier to do with us instead of going through the whole process again to create a new mold. Well, that's quite a dramatic savings in time and expenses, right, Patrick? Yeah, we... I mean, if you think about traditional injection molding, you need to amortize, you're making one thing and then you need to amortize that cost of the mold over many thousands of units. So you can typically, we like to think the break even point or something else we've done is around 10,000 units, maybe more. Like it's always cheaper to make a toothbrush with injection molding, right? But for us, we can make a run of 500, 1,000, 2,000 parts for someone and they can, as Oliver said, tweak it as they're going through it. and you don't have this 
twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars startup costs to get this mold made. And the interesting thing too, which I didn't realize until we looked into it a little bit more, is you know basically all of it is done in China, and then the company that makes the mold holds on to it, so you don't get it back. So then you have to continue to go back to them in the future to make things as well. So you're really wedded to them. So you don't have to go to China anymore. Just go to Brooklyn. Basically. Will costs, consumer costs, possibly go down when we buy products made through 3D printing? I mean, I can't tell what the company will do, but the, should the cost of the product to the company go down a lot? It, it depends on the product. And so going off of what, what Patrick and Oliver were saying, our sweet spot today are low volume runs. So typically we're making parts in under 10,000 units, whereas injection molding in China, wow. you know, that's when you might be making hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of units. You make 10,000 of what, for instance? Yeah, so uh, a great example is uh, we've worked with one of the, the largest uh, grocery chains in the United States. Okay. And uh, as some of you might know, you go into the grocery store and you swipe your credit card when you check out. And they have a major problem these days, which is people attach uh, credit card skimmers to those little devices. Right. And every time someone does that, it ends up costing the company m maybe millions of dollars uh, in, in kind of fraudulent charges and, and legal fees and so on. So we recently worked with this company to actually produce these physical devices that go on to these, these credit card swipers and prevent people from attaching skimmers. And so it's a great uh, it's a great example of something that would have never made sense to go and make in China because you don't need, you know, millions of units. But with us, they, they prototyped the idea. They made the first few hundred units, sent them out to stores, tested them. And once they verified it was effective, we made a, uh, 5,000 units. Worth. Give us one or two more examples. Well, just to build off of that, an interesting thing, too, is 3D printing allows certain things to be made that can't be made with traditional manufacturing methods like the device John was talking about has a really thin edge and it is so thin that it would curl with injection molding like it cannot be made that way so really we are the only way to make this device which save this company millions of dollars what else have you made a lot of that would be an interesting example I mean a great example is the work that we did with um, the enable community foundation now known as Limforge. they're a nonprofit uh, and they manufacture prosthetic hands, which are given away for free to children in third world countries. Come so on. this is an Enable product right here. Um, it's, uh, it's scaled up a little bit, but the, the concept is you can use wrist action to control your fingers. And so uh, for children, it, but this is unbelievable. For children uh, who are maybe missing um, certain fingers or digits, uh, oh they can actually play again because they can use this to hold on to their bike or their scooter. Uh, it's an incredible device, and, and we make them uh, for $25 each. Uh, and we've made thousands of these, uh, yeah, which are made up of, you know, dozens of parts each. And we're able to make a variety of sizes, which you can imagine with a prosthetic, the fit and the size is critical. How long did it take to make this once you started making them? How long did it take to make each one? So we started with a design file, and in, once we're in production, uh, each one takes about 10 hours of printer time to manufacture. But you don't have to stand over it, right, for 10 minutes like a person running a machine? Exactly. So the printer may run for 10 hours, but we have 200 of them. And once you spin them up, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, stand over and watch them the entire time. Wow. Um, will 3D printing put thousands of people out of work someday? Or yes, no, or don't know yet? That, that is the question that's going around right now. So, I mean, I think the, the larger question here is, will automation put people out of work, right? And what people don't realize is, you know, a lot of the jobs that, that left the United States, uh, it was because of cheaper labor in other countries. Meanwhile, the United States is actually still a, a massive manufacturing power. Uh, we've just applied a lot of robotic automation uh, to our, our factories. They've been saying manufacturing is dead for 40 years. Yeah, well, well we would actually argue that it's coming back. And we would also argue that uh, robotic automation or additive manufacturing, 3D printing, are key uh, components of it coming back to the United States. Us as a startup, just as an example, we wouldn't be uh, able to operate profitably if we didn't apply some amount of automation. And today, we employ 22 people full-time in New York City, and we have big plans to grow and, and hire more people. And again, that, that just wouldn't be possible if we were relying on, on purely just labor costs. Patrick? Well, yeah, I mean, I think more than anything, manufacturing is evolving. I think the days where you have, 
you know, the old Ford River Rouge plan where you had 100,000 people in one location, you know, I don't think those days are ever coming back. And I don't think there's going to be a time where people are getting paid, you know, $20 an hour to pull a lever for eight hours a day. It really, it's evolving. And, you know, there are many different views of the future manufacturing, but I think that we've developed one. And it's the sort of thing where you know, we can create these plants, basically, and pop them down to, uh, around the country to provide, like, a faster time to the consumer or, you know, the, the end customer. So there's more customization. There's a clue as to what your plans are. You're going to pop down 3D voodoo printings all around the country, that, right? I mean, that's too much, Patrick. <laughs> that, but there, there's you go. There you go. That's, that's, that's really where automation is going is we think it's going to relocalize manufacturing because when you, you kind of get rid of the, the high cost of labor, you can localize manufacturing and, and, and make your transportation more efficient. This is so interesting. I just have a few more questions uh, that, that I want to get in. How did you raise money? What advice do you have to somebody who wants to raise money for their business? What did you learn? We went, um, I mean, we, we've been around for three years. Um, we've raised money a few different ways. When we started, it was just friends and family. I think we were lucky enough to, to get started with some of our own investment and the investment of people we knew. Um, but obviously, that doesn't get you very far. Um, and uh, your first step is to utilize your network. Right. And if you don't have a network, you need to find one. And I can not recommend uh, highly enough uh, a startup incubator called Y Combinator, which is based in California. And although we're physically located in, located in New York, uh, we were a part of Y Combinator. Um, and uh, they really helped us raise money. And do you call them and say, hey, I'd like an interview? Or do you find them? Or how do you get involved with somebody like Y Combinator? They have an application process twice a year. Uh, okay. They have a, a three-month batch and you basically join a batch for three months and raise money at the end of that time period. Here's something interesting about these four gentlemen. You know, often in business, a couple of partners will find a business, and after a couple of years, they'll go their separate ways. These four have started and sold another business before they started this one together. What was that business? So the, the last business was also in 3D printing, and the story gets more interesting because uh, actually three of us founded that company, right. and we sold that company to uh, a New York-based business here called MakerBot. Uh, and Patrick was the head of M&A at MakerBot. He's the one that bought that company. Now, I've heard of MakerBot. Are they different from Voodoo 3D? Yeah, the difference basically is MakerBot focuses on making equipment. They make 3D okay. printers, and okay. we've... I guess we use 3D printers to make stuff. Okay. So instead of making the machines, we use the machines to make things. See, and so often deals go back to personal relationships. That's what happens. And uh, John, you also uh, told me something interesting about how the nature of startups are changing today. St startups are different from what they used to be. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, historically, when people started businesses, they were more what you might call a lifestyle business, right? So I'm going to start this company, it's going to provide me, you know, with a solid income that I can just kind of live on for the rest of my life. Uh, but these days, I think for a handful of reasons, when people start companies, the intention is typically high growth. Uh, and, and fast growth right off the bat right off the bat and you fuel that growth with really uh, an infusion of capital of money from venture capitalists and then also you build your company on top of technology and these days I mean every company is a technology company uh, whether you're a restaurant or an advertising company you just have to be a tech company and I think kind of that that convergence is, is what's causing this massive kind of gold rush in the startup space. You know, it's been great to talk to you and learn a little bit about 3D printing. And um, it's nice to meet the faces of the new technology because that's how you understand it so much better. So no matter how much 3D printing and artificial intelligence and everything else there is, there's nothing like meeting the people doing it and learning and understanding from them. Thank you very much, and good luck, and I think we'll hear more about you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.